Hi guys, James at Rampant Lion Reviews again for you today with another beer review. For this one, we are going to head up to Norway once again for the first time in what feels like a good little while. So we're going to introduce a brewery that has never featured on the channel before. These guys are a very new addition to the Norwegian beer scene and they've been getting a lot of positive press in recent times. We had one of their beers on tap in the Bishop's Arms in Gustav Torrey in Malmö and it went down very well actually. It was quite an impressive beer. I can't remember 100% but I think it may well have been this one so I might have tried this beer before, we'll need to see. But this one is also their first canned release through System Volaget here in Sweden too. So this is quite a nice one to be able to introduce to you here on the channel as my first review from this brewery. But uh, it's a combination of two sub-styles, one of which can be hit or miss for me, the other one which is one of my favourite styles of course. But uh, yeah, I think this should make for a very interesting review. So needless to say, I'm very curious to see what it's going to have in store for us. Hopefully it's another good beer. Hopefully it makes for an interesting review. And as always, I hope that you guys enjoy my take on this one as well. And it's always nice to introduce new Norwegian breweries on the channel too. So yeah, for this review then, we are going to head to Oslo. We're going to go to the northeast of the city, to the Stovner area. And we're having a little look at my first beer from Creature Brewery. So this particular beer is called Bonestirke, which I think is bone strength in English, if the Norwegian and the Swedish are the same here, which quite often they are. But this particular beer is 11.8% ABV. Uh, it's described as an imperial pastry stout with coconut, vanilla and geisha coffee, which comes from one of the local roasteries in Oslo, from what I understand. But uh, yeah, this beer was released as part of the Tilfelig sortiment through Sistembolaget here in Sweden in October of 2022. So yeah, let's crack on with this one then and see what we have. So, as always with my reviews then, I'll tell you a little bit about the brewery before we taste the beer. If you want to get straight to the tasting, just fast forward. All the usual links are in the video description below. That's the brewery website, the link to my other reviews that I'll do in the future from Creature Brewery. This is the very first time I'm trying one of their beers, as I mentioned, but there's all the usual social media down there. If you want to see more reviews, do please consider subscribing to the channel. The support you give is massively appreciated. And of course, you can, uh, yeah, and of course, you can uh, go and check out the channel homepage and search for beer based on country, city, state, county, province, prefecture. The whole channel has a geography based tagging system, and you can check out the playlists of beers from different countries too. This one, of course, is uh, found in the Norwegian playlist, and we will be adding more to that over the next little while. On that subject as well, if you would like to be my Norwegian beer mule and help supply me with some Norwegian beers to review, do get in touch with me through Instagram. It's always great to hear things like that. I send you some money, you sort out a beer box for me, it works. But yeah, let's crack on then and have a wee chat about Creature Brewery for the first time then. So, Creature Brewery, as I've mentioned to you already, are based in the Stovner area in the northeast of Oslo, the Norwegian capital, and the brewery was founded back in 2020 by Martin and Ellen Minerva Opdal Singsas, along with Matthew Doyle. So Martin has a background in IT, while Ellen has worked in various different bars and also in exports, but both of these guys were involved in founding Servicium from 2015 onwards, but they decided they wanted to move on and found their own brewing project. Uh, Doyle, as he's known on the other hand, is originally from England but lives in Vancouver over in Canada and he has a background as an illustrator and house designer but he was involved in Servicium as well. But Martin and Ellen had long wanted to have their own brewery and so they left Servicium in September of 2020 and they originally had plans to move up to Trondheim which I think is actually Ellen's hometown but they decided it was easier to stay in Oslo. They do have plans to open their own brewery in the future but they're currently brewing most of their beers at Arendal's brewery which is in Arendal to the south of, uh, of Oslo of course still in the south of Norway but they brew some of their beers at different places too this one apparently was brewed in Estonia I'm guessing it will have been brewed at Tanker because I know that Tanker do quite a bit of uh, uh, you know kind of contract brewing like that but um, yeah as it stands Martin is involved in the brewing side of things Ellen manages the sales and exports while Doyle is the art director and you might recognise there are some kind of similarities here uh, in the sort of style of the artwork if you like when you think about Servicium but they do of course have their own brand of course but you can see it's kind of the same artist. Uh, but the first release, uh, the first beers were released via Vin Monopolet which is the Norwegian uh, alcohol monopoly uh, in May of 2021 and they say that they're going to focus on a few different styles 
styles. So they do IPAs, smoothie sours and imperial stouts and of course there will be a few others along the way as well. But as of October 2022 when I'm filming this review for you, these guys have produced around 30 different kinds of beer and uh, yeah we will no doubt see more from these guys at some point in the near future. But that is all I can really tell you about Creature Brewery for the moment. I think that's quite a nice introduction to them, of course. Basically, some of the guys from Servicium broke off and started to do their own beer brand as well. So, um, yeah, I think that's that. So let's crack on and actually have a little look at this beer itself. So I'll let you have a wee closer look at the artwork on this one before we open it up. As you can see, very, very nice uh, artwork in there. So compliments to uh, Doyle for this. But uh, yeah, plain black top on the can there. As I say, this makes me think again that it's Tanker Brewery in Estonia that this has been brewed at. So um, yeah, it looks pretty damn good. So you can see this is the creature symbol on the back here. You can see Bone Stierke, uh, Bone Strength, Imperial Pastry Stout with Coconut Vanilla and Geisha Coffee. It suggests that we use a snifter, which we are, uh, of course, using. I call it a tulip glass usually. But uh, yeah. Should be pretty nice, this one. So I forget how much this beer cost me. I want to say it was maybe 80 Swedish krona. Uh, that sounds about right. So it's about 8 euros, uh, somewhere in the region like £7.50 sterling then maybe, and I guess at the moment maybe about $9 American, something like that. So um, yeah, that should be everything we need to say about this one. But yeah, the coffee in this one, I should point out as well, it comes from Solberry and Hansen, who are an Oslo coffee roastery that were founded back in 1879. One of the oldest I've ever heard of, actually. So yeah, as you know, if you've watched the channel for any length of time, I'm a huge fan of Imperial Coffee Stouts. Even though I don't drink coffee, never really drink coffee, uh, but yeah, coffee beans are probably my favorite adjunct when it comes to uh, Imperial Stouts and things like that. Love good coffee beans. Especially since we've been trying a lot of Brazilian Imperial Stouts in recent times. But uh, yeah, let's have a look at this and see what we have. I think that's enough for us to take a look um, at the beer in the first instance. So yeah, let's have a wee look at this guy. So as you can see and as you would expect from an Imperial Stout, this one is poured with a good... I would say just over a half finger of a frothy, kind of light beige head, one or two big bubbles sticking toward the side of the glass, but a few little ones going up toward the bottom of that head there. But uh, yeah, overall, it does look pretty damn nice, I have to say. So uh, yeah, in terms of its colour, uh, as you can see, it's got that typical dark ebony rosewood colour that you would expect of an imperial stout. But when we shine the light through this one, yeah, when we shine the light through this, it does have a little bit of that Coca-Cola Pepsi Max coloured edge to it, but this one is pretty damn black as night. There's not a lot of light coming through this. It is pretty damn opaque, but um, yeah, I think it does go together very, very nicely in that sense. So remember, the colour of your beer depends on one, the type of malts that you use. This goes a long way to determining your EBC rating. Two, length of your wort boil is also going to play a role because the longer you boil the wort, the more the sugar is caramelised and thus you get a darker colour beer. Any battle that you do or any adjuncts that you put in the beer will affect the colour too. But when it comes to black beers like Imperial Stouts, it's actually very difficult to uh, get over that black malt. Although the coffee will no doubt add some uh, colour to the beer as well. And you know, this one contains, I think it said it contains uh, oats and wheat. So that will... Um, play some role in the opacity of this beer, the fact that there's not a lot of light passing through it. But it certainly does look very, very nice, this one. Nothing really unusual about its appearance. The head has faded away to be a kind of thin foamy layer with a bit of a ring around the edge of the glass. So yeah, nothing surprising about this beer in terms of its appearance when we consider what style it is. But I think we should have a little look at the aroma now and just see what we get from this one. So let's do it. Yeah, this does smell pretty nice, actually. I've got a feeling this might well be the one that we had on tap at Bishop's Arms. It just it smells familiar, so I need to check that. I'll check with Alan, but I think I've got a feeling it might have been. But yeah, aroma-wise, this is quite interesting. This beer, for me, the first thing I'm noticing about it is that it's actually quite kind of phenolic and fruity and kind of cakey. It smells a little bit like Christmas pudding uh, initially. So yeah, that's the first note that I get out of this one so quite boozy quite phenolic and um, yeah the way that that goes together is pretty interesting um, so yeah I do like 
how this beer uh, goes together in that sense. We've got this big Christmas puddingy cakey thing. That's the first impression that I have of it. But other than that, um, you've got a few kind of distinct things going on. So let's try and break this beer down and describe it a wee bit more in depth. So yeah, the backbone of the beer, you can smell a little bit of that roasty, toasty, well-fired black malt. But as I say, on top of that, this beer just has this kind of Christmas puddingy, cakey sort of thing there. Um, and the, the sort of phenolicky, boozy, cakey character does, um, it really does um, kind of dominate the nose, actually. So that's really interesting. So yeah, a little bit of roasty, toasty, well-fired black malt in there. You can smell a few kind of woody and slightly nutty elements to the beer too. Then you've got the kind of cakey character sitting on top of that. Of course, that is, uh, you know, it's an imperial pastry stout. The beer, these beers tend to be like that. One of the things I said earlier that, you know, imperial pastry stouts can be a bit of a hit or miss for me. I don't like the ones that have the kind of granola -y type um, flavour to them. The ones that are a bit more cakey, which I think this one is going to be do I do tend to like, but yes, the ones that have that granola type note that I'm not a great fan of. But yeah, that thick kind of cakey type note to the beer. There is a little bit of like a sweet brown rye bread in there as well. And then on top of that, you can smell, for sure, you do get a bit of the vanilla in this one toward the front of the nose. That's definitely there. But you've also got um, a good little bit. You do get a bit of a chocolatey character out of this one. There's a bit of milk chocolate mixing in with the vanilla there, but you do have some of that, you know, higher percentage cocoa dark chocolate as well. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that the coffee beans are actually quite subtle in this beer. I mean, the coffee beans, they're very smooth. They've got a little bit of smooth earthiness in there, and they've also got a wee bit of uh, floral character as well. But, um, yeah, the way that that goes together, I think, is... Um, the way that that thing go the way that that goes together is pretty um is pretty nice so yeah um so the, the the yeah definitely the the coffee beans in this one for me they've got a bit of a small they've got a bit of a smooth earthy roast to them but they do have quite a bit of aromaticity and also some kind of red fruity character as well which mixes in with the dark chocolate that you have in this beer um the interesting thing for me is that I'm not getting much in the way of coconut I think the the you know the coffee bean and the kind of cakey phenol elements that you get out of this beer they actually suppress um quite a bit of other stuff going on here or i think maybe a more accurate way to say that is that that those aromas dominate the beer and it really takes your nose a bit of time to adjust and pick up the other things that are actually going on so if you are going to spend a wee bit of time smelling this beer just let your nose properly adjust to this one because it's a wee bit difficult to get over some of these kind of things but of course they will come out a lot more easily in the flavour, I would say. But um yeah, as I say, it's the, the whole backbone of this beer is this sort of big, uh, boozy, Christmas puddingy type quality. So yeah, that's definitely in here. Um yeah, aroma wise, I think this one is pretty it is pretty nice in that sense. So um yeah, it goes together very, very well for me. Um, there's a little bit of brown sugar in this one. You do get a wee touch of the kind of treacly molasses note to it. Um, but again, it's the it kind of feels like that's mixed in with the, the Christmas pudding sort of thing. So um, yeah, aroma-wise, this one is pretty damn nice, actually. So it gets a big thumbs up from me. Um, yeah, I think in terms of hoppiness and fruitiness, um, of course, an Imperial Pastry Stout is not the most hop-forward of styles. But you do get a little bit of stuff out of this one. You know, there's certainly a wee bit of earthiness there on the back of the nose. There's a wee touch of floral character and also a bit of grassiness. And the thing is, this beer at 11.8%, you can age this one a little bit. Um, I've never, I've not really had so many aged Imperial Pastry Stouts right enough. Although in fairness, you know, there was the Dessert in a Can series from, uh, from Amundsen, which was quite interesting. Um... But yeah, this one, I don't know how well barrel aging works and stuff, and aging itself works on imperial pastry stouts. But this one, you can smell that the hoppy character has dropped out a little bit. Good little bit of grassiness, good little bit of floral character, and also some nice uh, earthiness. But yeah, there's a wee bit of, uh, there's quite a bit of fruity character to this one. And as I say, it's quite phenolic. So you've got a bit of a sharper raisin in there. You've definitely got plums, but underneath that, you've got prunes and dates and stuff like that. Definitely some brighter uh, kind of blackberry qualities as well. Some sharper blackberries in there. And uh, 
Yeah. Probably obviously a little bit of black currant. But as I say, the kind of dominant note in the aroma of this beer is absolutely the 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 kind of boozy chocolate cakey uh, Christmas cake sort of thing, Christmas pudding type quality. So yeah, as I always say, take a wee bit of time and just go over the aroma of this beer and see what you think, especially with this, because it is quite quirky and unusual. I have to admit as well with this one, it does say on the back, you know, brewed behind the import sticker, brewed in Estonia. So I'm wondering if this one has been brewed at Tanker, uh, just, you know, because of the black can and stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I think we can have a look at this beer now. As I always say, they'll take a bit of time and enjoy that aroma. But yeah, this one is the Bone Stierke, uh, an 11.8% ABV Imperial Pastry Stout with uh, some geisha coffee from a local roastery in it, Solbori and Hansen's, if I remember, Solbori and Hansen's, uh, and some, what was it, cocoa nibs, coconut, and vanilla added into the brew. So let's have a taste of this and see how we go. Slange it, skull, cheers, definitely cool to introduce Creature Brewery to you here on the channel. Let's do this. Yeah, to say that is pretty damn nice. Um, I think this is definitely. I, I th I'm pretty sure, ninety five percent sure, this is the one we had on tap in Bishop's Arms. And I think, to be honest, I actually think this one is a bit better out of the can than it is on tap. Uh, and of course, the main difference is some of the flavours come out slightly differently because of the mouthfeel. But I think this one is actually maybe a bit better in the can than it was on tap. In fairness, so that's interesting. So, yeah, I'm going to say straight away, this is one of the pastry stouts that I can get on board with. doesn't have that granola flavour in it that I don't like, but um, yeah, this one uh, is, is pretty damn nice. First impression of it is the coffee is a lot more pungent. It builds up, you know, it really has a bit of punch in the aftertaste. It does have that big kind of Christmas pudding quality that you can pick up in the aroma. That's quite abundant in the flavour of this beer. But um, yeah, it absolutely works. So gets a big thumbs up from me this one. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's break this one down then and just uh, let's break this one down then and describe it for you properly. But I will say straight away, very nice beer. I'll need to try one of the IPAs from these guys and see what it's all about. So yeah. Middle third of your palate then, let's do that. Backbone of the beer, absolutely, you get a little bit of that roasty, toasty, well-fired bread crust on the base there, but it's actually, it smoothens out very nicely. It's kind of enveloped a little bit by the layer on top of that, which is that, you know, oily, Christmas puddingy, chocolate brownie type thing. That just envelops everything, actually. So, yeah. So yeah, um, toward the front of um, toward the front of that middle third of your palate, you can pick up one or two little nutty and woody flavors. Definitely, I do, I do get a little bit of a woody um, backbone, especially at the front of that middle third of the palate. A few nutty flavors in there. Then you've got the big thick. Um, you do have the big thick um, kind of cakey brownie sort of thing on top of it. So yeah, that's definitely very nice in this one. Um, yeah, on top of that, I would say, yeah, on top of that, I would say that it's, um, you, you do start to get some of the other flavours as well. So yeah, roasty, toasty, well-fired, well-fired, um, bread crust there gets a bit more bit of the further back you go, but as you come further forward on the middle third of the palate, there's a little bit of nuttiness, as we say, a little bit of wood, then the kind of really thick, boozy, chocolate brownie, Christmas pudding sort of thing. Then on top of that, you start to get the other layers. There's a little touch of like an almost sweet rye bready character just sitting on top of that for me. I love German rye bread, of course. I still miss that from my time in Heidelberg. But yeah, on top of the kind of rye bready layer, you can feel the chocolate uh, layer as well. So at the back of that middle third of your palate, you get a more kind of, you know, 70, 80% cocoa chocolate. But then yeah, as you move further forward, you get a little bit of um, 
you get a little bit of a uh, more milky chocolate coming out of the beer and you can feel that's when you get the vanilla so the chocolate and the vanilla have this kind of um have this interaction in there um it's interesting too because i am you get the coconut in this one the coconut's actually quite subtle for me i don't pick up too much of it but then again coconut isn't something that i really eat or have contact with all that often other than in the beers but yeah the coconut for me kind of mixes in as well with the vanilla and gives you that yeah it sits there at the front of that middle third of your palate but i think it gets a wee bit more prominent should we say the further into the aftertaste you go um yeah so yeah at the front of the middle third of the palate yeah you've got the vanilla you've got the coconut and you've also got the uh, that kind of mixing in with everything else there um, and it's kind of like you've got a, a kind of big oily sort of bowl or circle in the middle third of your palate as well so you can feel there is a little bit of this treacly molasses sort of thing but I get the impression the the brown sugars in this beer are not overly, overly leathery I think this might be a double mash imperial stout rather than being one that has a particularly long wort boil because yeah You've got this circle in the middle of your palate where the brown sugars come out. So in the dead centre of that, you get a lot of treacle and molasses coming out of the beer. So there's a lot of that in there. But as you move further out from that, it does kind of brighten up a little bit and give you a straight-up caramel, then a wee touch of uh, biscuit on the outsides. But other than that, um, the brown sugars are not overly prominent in this one. And it's you've kind of got a little bit of a battle going on, in a sense, between the brown sugars and the kind of boozy Christmas pudding -y side of this beer. So that's quite interesting too. Um, other than that, I don't think there's that much to say about the middle third of your palate with this one. So we'll move further back to the back third of the palate and we can also talk about the coffee beans now as well. So for me, um, the border region between middle third and back third of your palate, you've got a nice little bit of, um, you've got a nice little bit of a kind of bready build up in there. Um, and you also get, yeah, a nice little bit of bready build up and you've also got a wee bit of that kind of, um, you, you also get a little bit of the more kind of grainy side to it as well, but the coffee beans are very much merged uh, in that border region for me. So let's just look specifically at the coffee bean flavours. So yeah, for me, the coffee bean, very much a... Uh, it has a nice little bit of a roasty toasty. Um, it's got a bit of that roasty earthiness in the backbone. And I think that does build the further into the aftertaste that you go. But there is a good level of aromaticity to this one. And also, it's got quite a deep red fruit. You know, it is like a more kind of plummy character that comes out of the coffee. But certainly the earthiness and the aromaticity kind of build the further into the aftertaste that you go. So, um, yeah, I like. I do like how this goes together. Um, yeah, the way that this beer goes about, uh, goes about its business in that sense is, um, is quite nice. Um, the, the coffee bean really comes out, as I say, it kind of comes out further into the aftertaste, but let's look at the back third of the palate and we'll describe a bit more about the coffee in that sense. So definitely on the back third of the palate, you get that more roasty, toasty, well-fired, um, you get that roasty, toasty, well-fired. Uh, backbone coming out a lot more on top of that the cakey layer is there and it's taller as well and it's, it's kind of a little bit dense so it is a little bit taller a little bit more dense but then on top of that you can feel the coffee beans they kind of spread on top of the that kind of cakey layer and lie there and you do get a bit more of the fruitiness and the kind of aromaticity out of the beer from that point in time as well uh, for that position I should say but pardon me, above all of that, you do get some of the more yeasty esters out of the beer, and it is like a kind of thick kind of brown bread with a bit of a honeycomb type quality to it. So the yeasty notes are just sitting on top of the coffee beans for me on the back third of the palate. But absolutely, back third of the palate, you can feel the flavour is definitely uh, taller. And then as you come further forward into the middle third of the palate, things just kind of squash together that wee bit more. So yeah, I think we've covered everything we need to say about the malty and yeasty side of this beer. So let's look at the hoppy and kind of fruity side of things. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, 
Imperial Pastry Stout is not the most um, hop forward of beers, if you like. So in the back corners of the palate with this one, you definitely get a wee touch of earthiness here. Not too much, but as you move further forward, you get a little bit of a herbal character, and as you push towards the kind of front corners of the palate, you've got a bit of that floral aromaticity as well. Um, so yeah, you do get that, but of course you can feel with this one, again, not it's not too hoppy, but round the front curve of the palate, you can feel a little bit of a lighter grassiness in there. There's also a wee bit of a more zesty character as well, but um, yeah. I think it does go together pretty uh, pretty nicely in that sense. The, the hoppiness just adds a wee bit of depth to the beer, but yeah, you could age this and the hoppy character would disappear that little bit more. I don't think it would make have so much of a detrimental impact on the beer, we could say that. But let's focus on the front third of the palate and the fruity side of things then. So... The border between front third and middle third of your palate, again, you get a little bit of that kind of cakey bready build up in there. It is a little bit like a, you know, a chocolate brownie or, you know, a muffin, something like that. A bit of a mix between a chocolate brownie and a muffin and the base of that front third of your palate is more kind of muffin and brownie like. And then on top of that, you've got that nice oily bubble where um, the, all the juicy fruity esters just roll their way out of the beer. So yeah. In terms of the fruity side of things then at the back of that front third of your palate you get this kind of raisiny sharpness sitting on top uh, underneath that you get this mix of like it's like a plum and cherry kind of note it's almost got the kind of the sharpness of the cherry so you get a mix of that kind of sharp plum and cherry kind of quality in there there's a wee bit of uh, prune like a dried prune underneath and you're also getting like a wee bit of a datey type quality there's just kind of boozy dating note in there but as you move further forward on the base of the front third of your palate it's a little bit more kind of figgy and oily and then into the front half of the front third of your palate you get a little bit more of a black currant uh, note and also a bit of an oily blackberry sitting on top of that so um, yeah the way that this beer goes about its business on the fruity side is, is quite nice but it's definitely a bit more of a kind of oily I wouldn't call it sharp or tart but there is certainly a little bit of um, kind of punch to the fruity side of the beer in this one so that's that is quite interesting but it's it's an interesting beer this one as i say it really reminds me of chocolate pudding i think my dad would very much enjoy this beer he always he always wanted christmas pudding for his birthday cake in february my mum used to make it um so yeah we do know uh, i have got quite a strong sense of christmas pudding actually um i could always you know there's a lot of flavor association there for me everyone of course has a different kind of point of reference you guys might describe these flavors a bit differently uh, from me and of course I think Christmas pudding varies from country to country so I'm talking about the Scottish Christmas pudding so it's kind of when I say that what I mean is like a kind of you know booze soaked um, kind of spiced bready cake if you like I think that's a good way to describe it but um, yeah certainly interesting from that perspective um, yeah, in terms of the, um, yeah, in terms of the overall mouthfeel, I think we've said everything we need to about the flavour of this beer. In terms of the mouthfeel, I would say this beer, it's certainly not the thickest of Imperial Stouts I've come across. It's kind of top end of mid-bodied, bottom end of full-bodied, but certainly not by no means the thickest of Imperial Stouts that, I'll, that I've come across before. So yeah, um, in that sense, uh, for me, yeah, top end of mid body, bottom end of full body, carbonation is, is very smooth in this one. It's kind of silky in a sense, and also a little bit oily, a bit of silk and a bit of oiliness in the mouthfeel. In terms of IBUs, the coffee bean does give it a wee bit of bitterness as to the hops. I mean, I think this one's maybe a sort of 50, 60 IBU um, stout in that sense, but it wouldn't surprise me if it was a bit less than that, of course. Since I got into craft beer those years ago, the IB, you know, bitterness has, as a trend has kind of gone down because of the, the New England IPAs and so on. So I think this is about a 50, 60 IBU beer from the coffee and so on. But always take my IBU counts with a pinch of salt. Weakest point of my beer reviewing for sure. But the malty base in this beer, as we said, we've got a bit of roastiness. We've got a bit of smoothness in there, a little bit of sweetness. 
and uh, so on. So we do have that um, kind of in this beer, a little bit of brown sugar, a little bit of kind of chocolatey side of things um, as well. And this is just a big cakiness to this beer. So the malt base for me, I'm still getting used to these pastry stouts in a sense, but there are a few different things going on with this one. But yeah, nice juicy fruity character to it. And like I said, it gets a thumbs up from me. I do like this one. As I say, Imperial Pastry Stouts, still not my most, still not my favourite style of beer, but this is certainly one of the ones that I could uh, kind of enjoy actually. It's, they are quite sickly and for me they're a little bit harder to, to drink in a sense. I kind of prefer a more old school Russian Imperial Stout or an Imperial Milk Stout. Uh, those are the two that kind of go down a treat for me. But um, yeah, I think we can leave it at that for this one. This has been an interesting beer to try. So yeah, this one is the Bonestierke from uh, Creature Brewery in uh, Oslo in Norway. So yeah, have a go at this one and see what you think. I can feel the booze in this beer going to my head. It's 11.8% ABV, but it covers its alcohol pretty well. So uh, yeah, once again, thank you for watching my beer reviews. Until the next time, please like, subscribe, share, all the usual YouTube stuff. Let me know your own thoughts on this beer in the comment section below. Let me know what your favourite beers are from Creature Brewery as well. And we will no doubt return to these guys at some point very, very soon. So until the next time, slanget, skull, cheers, check out my social media, check out Creature Brewery social media, and we'll see what else we can find from these guys going forward. Slanget, skull, cheers, see you guys very soon.